Good evening. How are you doing? Uh, welcome to the latest in my series, Stories of Greatness. Um, it's not quite two weeks since my surgery. Uh, if you're interested in what it is, check out the other videos, it's all there. Um, so, I'm not actually allowed to drink. Um, but I figure, how can they possibly find out? So, um, plus it's, it's only wine, that's not a real drink, right? So tonight, I'm sure those of you that have been waiting for this video are fully expecting this to be Daniel Mendoza Part 2. However, it isn't. Um, I'd like to talk to you tonight about uh, a young man who is arguably the greatest natural talent to ever set foot inside a boxing ring. And that's quite a claim, but I think it's one that holds up. Uh, so the person we're going to talk about is James Jem Belcher. He was born in uh, 1781, on the 15th of April, uh, in his father's house, St James's Churchyard in Bristol. And he came from a fairly illustrious line of boxers. We know from previous videos that Bristol, after Jack Slack moved there, kind of became a second centre of, of pugilism within the United Kingdom and produced a lot of great fighters. Um, but uh, Belcher was a little bit special because Belcher's mother was Slack's daughter. And she idolised her father. So, in effect, Jam Belcher was born into a family where boxing was effectively the greatest achievement that a man could hope to attain. Um, and it turned out that he'd inherited all of his father's, his, sorry, his grandfather's skill. Um, and his strength, and his ability, and, and in every way he was, he was stunningly good. The first record we have of him fighting was at the age of 12 at a local country fair. Um, we don't know much about it, but we know that it was, it was a proper fight. He was attended by his brother-in-law, Bob Watson, as a second, and he fought another boy and, and soundly beat him. Um, I've not yet found out any de details about that, so if you've come across any, do let me know. Um, the next time that, that we know anything about this was, was when Belcher was a teenager. Uh, he was 16 years old and he'd gone with, with various members of the family to Lansdowne Fair, not far from Bath. Uh, and while he was there, he noticed that at the fair there was a, a, a boxing booth with various people who'd travelled from the capital in order to earn a bit of money and, and challenge the locals to fight. So Belcher, who wasn't a particularly large um, child, um, paid his money and stepped into the ring. He strapped on a large pair of mufflers and he faced up against a young man by the name of oh, Sam Lowett. Um, he proceeded to give Sam Lowett, who was an up-and-coming fighter, a young cabinet maker from the cabinet who'd been sent out to, to effectively earn his stripes and to get a bit of ring time before he came back to fight properly. He was beaten senseless by Belcher. Um, to the point where Lowett was so incensed, he ripped his gloves off and offered Belcher the opportunity to fight him properly without gloves. Assumedly, he thought that this would um, put this, this yokel in his place. Uh, Belcher agreed very happily to fight Lowett without gloves and proceeded to, to utterly destroy him in a way that was even more one-sided than when, when the gloves were on. Uh, before the fight could be officially finished, however, a large, heavily built man, who'd obviously spent quite a bit of time in the ring, kind of charged through the crowd, grabbed Lowett and dragged him out of the ring. Uh, it turned out the, that Lowett was engaged to this man's younger sister. Um, as you can imagine, uh, Belcher wasn't particularly happy about this. And he noticed that the man who, who'd come in and stopped the fight looked very familiar. It was none other than the famous pugilist, Bob Britton. 
Um, so Belcher effectively said, well, if you won't let him fight me, will you fight me instead? And Britain took one look at him and laughed, said, no, don't be stupid. Britain was a large, heavily built man, very experienced in the ring, and Belcher was, was just a kid. Um, but he was a very cocky kid. So he publicly accused Britain of cowardice. At which point, the two agreed to fight. Um, they set up the next day, and they, they fought in the ring, officially, with seconds. And Belcher just dominated. It wasn't a particularly fast fight, but it was significantly faster than a skinny 16-year-old had any right to beat an experienced pugilist in the prime of his career. At this point, um, Belcher's family realised that perhaps he was a bit special. So he went to London and the family used their connections to introduce him to William War, who was a, an old boxer himself but was a fairly prominent member of the fancy. And the two of them, after dinner, set to spar. Basically, War didn't really believe that Belcher could be as good as he'd been told. And said to him, let's have a bit of a spar. They strapped some gloves on, and for a good five minutes, the two of them lightly sparred in the dining room. And War simply was unable to even touch Belcher. At which point, he stopped the fight, and he took his gloves off, and he said, I will back you against any man in England. Uh, and as good as his word, not long afterwards, he was matched against Tom Paddington Jones. Now, Tom Paddington Jones was probably one of the greatest fighters to never win the championship. He falls into the same category as people like Thomas Futrell and Richard Humphreys, in that they were, they were pretty much at the top of the game. But they were fighting at the same time as people like Mendoza and Jackson. So you had to be something incredibly special. And Paddington Jones had never really made it to that very top level. He'd never attempted to, to, to either. He'd supposedly fought and won more than a hundred competitive matches. And at this point, Belcher had had one official competitive match without the gloves. So, Everybody kind of knew how it was going to go. Um, however, they were wrong. It, it took half an hour, and Belcher was magnificent. He was mobile. He darted in and out. He was hitting so fast that the people that were watching were unable to see exactly what it was he was doing. Yet he was hitting so powerfully that he was doing significant damage. He was a veritable force of nature. This 16-year-old boy destroyed Tom Paddington Jones in half an hour. Then he was matched up against Jack Bartholomew, um, who he destroyed in even less time. And it seemed that nobody could stand against him. And this was a bit of a problem, because the title was vacant at this point. This was after Jackson had beaten Mendoza for the title, but Jackson had officially retired. And really, at this point, nobody else had stepped up to claim the title as their own. So, in order to attempt to, to claim the title for him, himself, Belcher challenged Mendoza. Mendoza was still fighting at this point, um, though hadn't really managed to get himself back up to the heights that he'd been at before. But he was the only previous, the only former champion still fighting. So Belcher's plan was to, to beat Mendoza and then be able to claim the title. Um, however, it wasn't to be simple. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to some of the other videos on Mendoza. But effectively, Mendoza at this point had left England because if he didn't, he was going to get thrown in debtor's prison. Um, but he did agree to fight on the condition that the fight took place in Scotland. The fancy were not keen on this. Um, they didn't really want to have to travel to Scotland to see a fight. Not one that they were going to be paying for, anyway. Um, so it was agreed that Mendoza's debts would be paid if he were to fight in England. 
He was quite happy with this. However, as he tried to enter London, he was arrested and thrown in prison for a breach of the peace. What we've got to remember is that, technically, public displays of competitive violence were illegal. Um, it's a bit of a woolly area in the law, but if somebody had a bit of a grudge and wanted to prove a point, they could lock you up for it. And that's exactly what happened at this point. So Mendoza was thrown in prison. The fight with Belcher and Mendoza never happened. So after a little while, um, the, the, the fancy, the backers of Belcher, decided that he should fight uh, an Irishman by the name of Andrew Gamble. Andrew Gamble was a pretty successful, ferocious man. Uh, very large, very successful, and he was another one of those people who was almost at the top of the game, not quite able to claim the championship, but was, was on his way. And pretty much whoever won the fight between Belcher and Gamble would be acclaimed champion of all England. Gamble, however, didn't really want to leave this to chance. He'd seen Belcher fight and heard great things about him and realised that he might not beat him in a fair fight. So he paid four men to waylay Belcher and injure him not, bef not long before the fight in order to give Gamble that edge. So one night, these four men waylaid Belcher. Um, before they even got their hands on him, Belcher had knocked three of them clean out. The fourth one, at this point, ran away. But it seemed that Belcher wasn't just good at, at fighting. He was quite good at running, too. Um, so he chased this guy down, caught him, and if we believe the contemporary accounts, he literally kicked him in the arse until he begged him to stop. Um, so the fight with Gamble was still on, and now Belcher was angry. So on the 22nd of December, 1800, on Wimbledon Common, under the shadow of the gibbet, which still contained the rotting remains of the famous highwayman Jerry Abershaw, Gamble and Belcher fought for the title. Gamble was the favourite. He'd had more fights and was, was expected to win pretty conclusively. And the first round kind of showed that that was that was right, that the odds were in his favour correctly. What happened was he caught Gam he Gamble caught Belcher with a pretty solid blow, stepped in to close, and at that point Belcher realised that he was outmatched, so he instantly dropped a knee. Um, this was a practice that was, in the early days of pugilism, so in the early era and throughout the early part of the Bronze Rules era, it, it was... It was an acceptable way to end a round. If you literally, you just drop your own knee to the floor and that ends the round. Any part of your body from the knees up touches the floor, the round is over. Um, and what tended to happen is that canny fighters, people that were using, using their brain as well as just their fists, used to use this to their advantage. And we'll come across that in some of the other stories of greatness, specifically the one about Tom Johnson. Um, but Belcher used this. He realised that if Gamble got his hands on him, he was in trouble. So he dropped the knee, round was over, the two of them went away. 30 seconds later, back up to scratch. The second round, Belcher was a little bit cagier. And he kept his distance. And he used his greater mobility and his speed to, to keep Gamble at distance. And he caught him with a really solid punch just above one eye and floored him. By the time they came back up to scratch for round three, Gamble's eye was swelling closed. Um, he realised at this point that his only way to win was to get in close and effectively charge straight in at the beginning of that round, got hold of Belcher, flung him to the ground and literally leapt on top of him. Um, again, this was a fairly common tactic. Technically, you didn't need to do it, but the whole point of throwing somebody was to damage them enough so that they weren't able to come up to scratch. So it was a fairly common tactic, if excuse me, if a little frowned upon, to kind of, when you throw somebody, to throw yourself up in the air so that you land on top of them. You see it in, in MMA today, um, and it's a very effective 
method of, of, of taking the wind out of somebody if you can. Uh, Ronda Rousey used to do it a lot with some of her throws. She'd throw and she'd, she'd kind of get her body upright so that when you land, she'd land on top of you and, and that, would, that would just increase the violence of the throw a little bit. And that's what Gamble did to Belcher. Um, it didn't work, though, because after the 30 seconds, after their half minute, they came back up to scratch in, the, in round four and Belcher was seriously pissed off at this point. He, he effectively danced around Gamble and hit him at will until after a couple of minutes of this he punched him in the throat and floored him. But Gamble wasn't going to give up quite that easily. Um, he came back up to scratch for round five and in round five Belcher had just had enough. As Gamble stepped in to try and close Belcher caught him with a peg to the mark, a short contracted arm strike to the solar plexus. And as, as he, he winded him, as he, he, Belcher stepped round and caught him with a beautiful liver shot which dropped him to the ground and he simply did not get up. The fight was over. Uh, Gamble had lost, Belcher had won it. He was the champion of all England. And most impressively, he was the champion of all England completely undisputed, at age 19. It had never been done before. He was, he was considered the most amazing fighter. He was not only an amazing fighter, he was considered to be a stunningly beautiful man with uh, an eye for fashion. Um, people still refer to the Belcher neckerchief, which refers back to Jem Belcher, who was always pic pictured wearing this Belcher neckerchief. Um, he was a fashion icon, he was a socialite, he was the toast of the town, and everybody loved him. But he was also possibly one of the unluckiest fighters to ever grace the ring. Um, three years later, 24th of July in 1803. He was playing rackets in London. Um, it's, it's a game that's kind of reminiscent of squash. Uh, it's played in an enclosed room and with, with a small hard wooden ball. And his opponent hit the ball and it hit Belcher in the eye, full force. It knocked him out cold. He fell to the ground, fitting, his eye utterly ruined. And, and it effectively, that one incident destroyed him. Uh, eventually he recovered from it enough that he was able to, to function. And, and the fancy, his supporters, his backers, who, who'd always thought of him as being so fantastic, put him up. In, the, the, in a livelihood, they gave him the, the landlordship of a pub, um, but he, he just, he couldn't, he couldn't cope. The idea that he'd go from being the greatest boxer that had ever graced the ring to being uh, a has-been who stood behind the bar in a pub just, just didn't, it, it didn't sit well with him at all. He couldn't do it. And the one thing that, that burned the most for him was that one of the guys he'd beaten, one of the people that he'd defended his title against, was going to be declared champion because he couldn't fight anymore. So what he did is he sent to Bristol to an old friend of his, who he knew was a great boxer, a guy by the name of Henry Pierce. And we're going to find out a little bit more about Henry Pierce later. But the two of them at this point were close friends. Henry Pierce came, he beat all the potential challenges for the title and became acclaimed champion himself. But despite being the person that made this happen, Belcher, couldn't, he couldn't cope with it. It gradually ate away at him and in the end he challenged Pierce himself. Pierce, more than anything, felt, felt sorry for his own mate, old mate Belcher. Um, and whilst he beat him, it kind of it took the glory away from it for him as well. So not long afterwards he retired from boxing, gave up the title and moved back to Bristol. Um, at this point the championship was officially vacant one more time. 
and Belcher had become a bit obsessed, as you can tell. Um, so he claimed the title for himself again. But what that meant was that he had to face any challenger that the fancy would put up against him if he was able to retain that, to make that good on that claim. And unfortunately for him, there was somebody relatively new to the scene, a young up-and-coming man who the fancy had their eye on and put up against him, a young man by the name of Tom Cribb. Uh, the rest is history. We'll hear all about Cribb in another video. Uh, in 1811, aged only 30 years old, Belcher died. A bitter and broken man. And it's, it's probably one of the most tragic tales because he was fantastically good. And it all came crashing down and it was all taken away from him off the basis of a, a tragic accident. Um, but, you know, that's often the way these things work. So that's the story of, of Jem Belcher, the, the most gloriously gifted fighter to ever step foot in the ring. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Please check out some of my other videos. There are a number of stories of greatness and I'm recording more all the time. There are fight breakdowns as well. Um, subscribe. If you haven't subscribed already, that would be great. Um, click the thumbs up and, and write me a comment. Tell me what you think. Um, is there anything about Belcher that you know that I've missed out? Um, I apologise that this video is a little bit long. Um, you can tell that, that my 20 minute limit on my camera kicked in. So apologies for the little edit point. I normally try and get through without having to, uh, to, to take more than one take. But that's why I stumble over my words. Yeah, that's why. Um, thanks for watching it. If, you, if you've enjoyed this, please consider supporting me on Patreon. I know I say this at the end of every video, um, but it means a huge amount to me. Um, martial arts is my living. Writing about it, making videos about it, teaching it. Um, so if you're willing to throw me a dollar a month, that would be fantastic. Anything from a dollar a month upwards is hugely appreciated. There's a link up. Um, and, um, and I'll shush now. I'll see you soon. Take care, guys.